originally from Champion, Alberta, Canada, and has lived in Alberta, Utah, California, Idaho, and Texas. Thanks. All right. Well, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what I can do with this microphone in terms of hoping that you can hear what we're going to talk about. This is kind of an interesting setup. These little rooms, but uh, everybody here. All right, we're good. Everybody who wants to hear can hear. The rest of them are still checking their email and uh, and or playing games, which is what my students do. But. Danielle is being closely watched here, so we're okay. Um, yeah, I want to. We're, we're going to talk about uh, about bike lanes and about some of the impacts that have come as a result of bike lanes. I do want to uh, recognize actually my student who's working on this project, Chris Haskell. Uh, he's not here. I guess he's back uh, on campus. Not that closer. All right. He's, uh, I guess, back on campus doing some work there while, uh, while I'm here doing this. So what I'm going to talk about, I will try and incorporate Shauna's work into this as well. Uh, unfortunately, she had a family emergency come up and was not able to be here today. But what I'm going to talk about is let's give you some background on what it is that we're, we're doing with this research. Uh, then we'll talk about the active transportation policy just in general. Give you a little bit of information on the household survey that's been done uh, along with this. And then talk about the data. We actually ended up having to collect quite a bit of data uh, because we don't, we don't have a lot of bicycle data out there. And that's actually Shauna's, what Shauna's doing uh, is collecting data. So as we continue through both these projects, we'll have a lot more data and be able to continue to work on that. Uh, then we'll talk about the results and the conclusions that uh, come along with this. And then kind of some of the limitations that we've uh, had to work with as we've uh, been making these recommendations. And then we'll have a little bit of discussion and then talk about a little bit more about what Sean is doing on her side of the, the research as well. So as was indicated in, uh, of course, the introduction that we had here, you know, we've seen bicycle use has, has definitely been on the rise. Uh, one of the ways that I uh, get involved in, in bike use is I've got a son who's in high school and for those who don't know, there's actually high school mountain biking teams. So if you've got kids who love to, to bike, there's an alternative to playing basketball and soccer and football and all those other things. You can actually be on the, the mountain bike team. And so my son joined the team three years ago and it's been a great opportunity for myself as well as him to really get involved in recreational biking but of course that leads then into more of the commuter type biking and things that we're looking at uh, as part of this research. So our purpose here is really to increase understanding in terms of you know, the travel demand impacts and implementing bicycle uh, corridors or bicycle lanes of any kind uh, and comparing those to vehicle lanes. So that was the, the primary con or, uh, objective as we got started and we're still working towards that goal, but we've, we've done a lot of other things along the way. Um, and you know, what we really wanted to do is try and give UDOT some, some guidance, some understanding in terms of you know, where bike lanes are being used, how, we can, how UDOT can get involved in this and, and really be a, an advocate for what's happening uh, in terms of bicycling across the state. So this is the policy. How many of you have not heard of the active transportation policy? So we just have a couple people, some that maybe you're going to say yes or no. But uh, in essence, you know, UDOT has developed policy that says that we will look at alternative modes of transportation, active transportation, as part of all of our projects. And this is a, it's a relatively, I don't know, I have a year on there, 07. I mean, it's, it's relatively new, but maybe, it, maybe the policy itself isn't as new, but using it is more maybe starting to be used a lot more throughout the, the regions in terms of what's going on. So the policy's there, uh, the opportunity's there, so we just wanted to try and look at some of the different uh, impacts of what's happening with this. Along with that, of course, uh, relatively recently, there was also a household survey that was conducted. And there was a lot of information collected, of course, on transportation aspects. But there was a lot of questions asked in, in terms of uh, active transportation, bicycling specifically. 
So one of the first things we did is we looked at this to try and get a feel for where we're at in terms of you know, Utah individuals, uh, in terms of riding bicycles. So there was a couple of, couple of different things that I just want to highlight here. I mean, there's pages and pages and pages. David Bassett uh, went through all of this and had so much fun, he didn't know which, which of these to throw out here. But I'm just going to throw out two or three of the results. But we've got a lot more information on this if you're interested to kind of see what, you know, what's really going on with attitudes and, of people or perceptions uh, from the household survey. It was interesting to point out, first of all, when, when people were asked how often they ride a bike, you know, we had more than 50% of uh, people reported they never ride a bike. And the next question will kind of tie into that a little bit more, but, uh, you know, really we've, we've got a lot of people who had reported that they really, they don't, they don't ride a bike much. And, you know, we do live, of course, in a very beautiful, active state in terms of the things that can go on. And so hopefully we can look at ways that we can improve that. But, but that's the results that came out of that. Uh, the second one, when people are asked why they didn't ride a bike, we get that 50% thing again. 50% of people said, well, it's because I don't have a bike. So what we wish we would have asked after that was, if you had a bike, would you ride it? but that question didn't get asked. So, you know, those are all those fun things after you have a survey, when you're all done, you realize, oh, boy, I wish we would have asked that question. Um, so you can kind of see the results here, you know, more than 50%, they don't own a bike. Um, some people say their health doesn't allow them to ride a bike, they don't enjoy biking, the weather's terrible. You know, lots of reasons that they came up with in terms of uh, reasons for not riding a bike. And then, when we did start asking about, you know, when they, those who do ride a bike, we, we see that 90% of the people do it for, for exercise, and that's great. You know, health, health is obviously an important part of, of biking. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is, you know, what's the impact on commuters? So out of those who were surveyed, it was about 10% said that they bicycle to and from work, and about another 5% to and from school. So. One of the things, and this kind of comes up in our limitations at the end here, is, you know, we, we have some data, but we don't have a lot of big data points in terms of looking at the history of where that compares to the last time. You know, the last household survey was done a long time ago, and I don't know or remember if there, this question was asked there, but, but this is a good baseline for us to be working from at least. Uh, so here's kind of the other things here, personal business, shopping, uh, bike with children, that was another big one. Um, so trying to just get, get people involved. And then, so the last thing that, uh, that I'm including here at least is looking at, you know, what degree respondents agree with different aspects of active transportation. And, you know, for the most part, if you kind of start looking at this, we've got, oh, they told me not to get close to that. Um, so agree kind of goes up through the greens here in terms of the different aspects that are out there. But, uh, you know, a lot of people have said that they, they just couldn't fit it in their current lifestyle. They're too, they're too stuck to their car. We can't actually ride a bike. That would be too hard. And, you know, I, I've fallen into that category in different ways as well. Uh, having to share the road with motor vehicles, main reason I don't bike that often. You know, that wasn't quite as high on the agree side of things. Uh, what was the one? You know, as far as supporting transportation funds to help pay for projects such as sidewalks and bike paths, people were very much in agreement with that. And, uh, you know, being able to walk and bike was very much in agreement as well. So. You know, there, there's a lot of interesting results that are out there, uh, but in general, we kind of see that people, they're not opposed to biking. They like that as an opportunity. Their lifestyle maybe doesn't allow that, and uh, a lot of them don't have bikes. So we should all open up bike shops and have more bike shops out there so we can get more people riding bikes or something. So uh, the next thing that we went to, so that, you know, that was looking at existing data. We had looked at uh, collecting our own, doing our own survey, but this survey was already out there. We had you know, great response rates. So, so that gives us kind of some of the background in terms of what was, uh, what was happening there. 
Well, the next thing then we had to start doing is, okay, well, we need to start looking at bike data and see where people are riding, how many people are riding, and kind of start looking at correlations and relationships uh, in, in those uh, data points. So whenever you start any research project, you always hope that there's this big bank of data available, and then you don't have to collect any data. And then you can just analyze, do all kinds of things. But uh, unfortunately, that big bank of data wasn't there, so we had to go out and collect uh, a lot of data. So we went out and identified you know, uh, the infrastructure, first of all, what kind of infrastructure is available to us. And we started to look at you know, sites where we could collect data and then different methods in order to do that data collection. So if, uh, if you look at AASHTO, AASHTO identifies multiple types of, of bicycle facilities that are available to us. So we've got you know, multiple different types of shared lanes, marked shared lanes, paved shoulders, bike lanes, bike boulevards, shared use paths. All of these things are you know, different alternatives that we have available to us for infrastructure tied to, to biking. So these are just kind of some, some pictures of some of the different types of biking facilities out there. Uh, none of these are actually in Utah though. I did take all of them, but they're not in Utah. Uh, most of these are, some of these are in Portland, some are in Seattle. Uh, but you know, we've got a lot of uh, different alternatives in terms of bicycle facilities that are available to us. As we looked at the data here in, in Utah, we had a somewhat of a variety of facilities, but most of the facilities were just a simple bike lane. Just, you know, bike lane painted on the roadway and a shoulder that is, you know, utilized for biking. So uh, as we collected all of our data, we, we kind of lumped them all together in terms of with bicycle infrastructure and without bicycle infrastructure. We didn't have enough, you know, a wide enough range of data to, to break them out into you know, sharrows and, and shared lanes or uh, bike lanes or bike boulevards or any of the other specific types of, of uses. Uh, then we went out and we looked at places where we could collect data. We wanted the, the technical advisory committee wanted us to get a, a variety of locations. So we went to five different counties uh, and we collected data in nine different cities uh, in order to start getting somewhat of a cross section of data that we could, we could start to analyze. So you can see where the different uh, cities were uh, where we collected data. And uh, my students had a good time all summer driving <coughs> to collect bike data. But, you know, you gotta give them, you know, they gotta carry the data equipment and all that other stuff with them. But anyway, I gave them a hard time quite often that they should have just taken the bus and rode their bike and put it on the rack. But then they gave the whole, well, BYU doesn't give us a bike or a bus path. So, you know, anyway. That's a whole nother story. Um, so we looked at ways that we could collect data. Uh, the main way that we looked at uh, collecting data was through uh, the use of GMR Track Cycles Plus. So these are automated uh, bicycle data collection equipment. And so we went out and set uh, counters out over 48 hours minimum each time. And then we would do Tuesday, or, yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, or whichever 48 hour was gonna work best for us uh, for that particular week. And then in addition to that, we also went out and collected, well, I use the term we, uh, my students went out and collected manual data uh, in terms of looking at you know, bike volume, travel direction, gender, age, purpose. Uh, you know, They didn't stop people and ask them what their purpose was, but they tried to go off of the way the person was dressed as to maybe whether they were recreational or, <clears throat> or a commuter, uh, whether they had a backpack on or whether they had saddlebags or you know, kind of what they were doing to try and figure out what, they were, what their purpose was and then where they were biking. So they might have been on the sidewalk, they might have been in a lane, just kind of depended on where they were at. You didn't collect over weekends? <laughs> we did not collect weekends because we were looking for commuter. commuter traffic primarily. We did collect one set of data in, uh, in Provo, and there was a bike race going on. And uh, man, we got a ton of bikers. But uh, we threw that data point out. 
Still not sure why my student kept collecting while there was a bike race going on, but he did. We got the whole set of data. Anyway. All right. So then, uh, so we so we went out, collected all the data uh, over a period of uh, probably about a month and a half to two months. We collected data, and uh, you know we got a, a pretty good sample, uh, and so we started looking at what the results were. So. Now we're going to get into kind of some of the statistical analysis. So trying to figure out, you know, what what what's the, what are the data telling us? And so I'll look at kind of a mixed model analysis we did, and then we we started looking at comparisons. Well, what about on you know ADT? How does ADT affect the number of bikes on a roadway? What are, how does the speed limit affect that? What about the roadway classification? Uh, the number of lanes. So we so we started looking at all of these different relationships, and of course there's pretty high correlation between a lot of these, uh, but some of the results showed a little bit, little bit different results, but mostly they were pretty comparable. So the first was this uh, mixed model analysis, where essentially what we did was looked to try and, we, we, we threw all the data in, we, we uh, essentially just created a spreadsheet with all the different data points, the numbers of bikers, the ADT, the number of lanes, and uh, we ran this mixed model analysis to see what, what actually has the highest, you know, what, what tells us the most about these bike volumes. So although the, none of, well that's not true, there are a couple of the results coming up here in a little bit that are statistically significant, which means that we have a p-value of 0.05 or less. But to me, a lot of them are very practically significant. I'm not a statistician, and I'm not going to you know, talk bad about statisticians because we have at least one in the room here, and we, we don't want to do that. But uh, you know, we love statisticians in terms of what happens. But a lot of times in transportation, we have to look at practical significance. We have to look at trends, and you know, we may not have a big enough sample size. We may not have enough data to actually come up with a statistical significance. But but these are definitely very practical in terms of the results that came out. So the first one was uh, bicycle infrastructure versus bicycle volume. So this question we were asking was, if we have any level of bike infrastructure, bike lane, bike boulevard, shared lane, any of that, do we see a difference in terms of the volume on that particular roadway? And as we might expect, we saw between a 40 and 66% increase in bicycle volume when we have bicycle infrastructure. So if we will provide the infrastructure, more people will ride on that facility. They feel safer, I would assume, and they have that opportunity. We, for whatever reason, St. George skewed the data quite a bit, so we had one set without St. George and one with St. George. And, and the, actually, the St. George data were not quite as high as we thought they might be. Um, but it was also in July when we took those data points and it's pretty warm down there in July. The second thing that we looked at is, okay, well, what about AADT? How does AADT affect the bicycle volume that we're gonna see out here? And what we found was that, based on our sample at least, there was an 18% reduction in volume if the AADT was doubled. So that's not a huge difference, but I'll show you some trends here in a little bit that that show kind of those general relationships of what uh, what was happening with uh, ADT. So here's our, our ADT analysis. Um, and again, everything that we did, we analyzed all of the data, and then we analyzed the data with bicycle infrastructure and then without. Because we, we collected, we tried to collect an even number of, of samples as far as corridors at least, where we had bicycle infrastructure and then we looked at parallel routes that didn't have bike infrastructure, but were generally on more of a low volume, low speed roadway, but they, you know, they would get you to the same place. So that was kind of the different relationships that we looked at. So here's the, the general result. And again, here you know we've got a p-value of 0.173, so it's not statistically significant, but but I think it's practically significant. We can kind of see the trending in terms of as our ADT increases, 
our bike volumes decrease. And this this uh, scale down here, I guess I slid that out underneath the, the ANOVA results there, but that's actually the log of AADT. Gave us just a little better relationships than just regular AADT. Uh, but so we started to see the, the reduction there. This is on the roads with bicycle infrastructure. Again, we start to see that we see that general trending. And then on the roads without bike infrastructure, I mean, we, there's no trend there. I mean, that's a straight line, uh, <laughs> p-value of 0.93. So that just didn't really show us anything. When we looked at posted speed, we did the same things. So now instead of the ADT value, we looked at the posted speed values. And again, looked at all data points. Here we actually do have a statistically significant result in terms of as our, a, our speed limit de increases, the number of bicyclists decreases uh, significantly. Uh, the next one was with bicycle infrastructure, very close again, p-value 0.07. So we see that reduction. And then on the without bicycle infrastructure again, we've got, and again, there's a pretty high correlation between AADT and speed limit, uh, but speed limit gave us a lot better statistical results in terms of looking at, at uh, the data. So then we looked at a uh, number of lanes. Again, you know, another correlation between that, but this was trying to look at, you know, whether bikes would be more inclined to ride on roadways with less lanes versus more. Here we didn't really see much of, of a difference in terms of the, the different lane widths. Uh, this is looking at box plots and kind of the, you know, the average values are pretty similar. The, the six lane arterials, we didn't have a lot of data on those ones. And then uh, the same kind of thing on roadway classification, kind of starting to look at, you know, how did our roadway classification affect that? Again, we don't really see, you know, our local roads are down less, but the others are pretty similar in terms of those, uh, those uh, mean median values. So the question then you have to ask is, well, so what does all this mean? What are you, what are you getting at here? that's what you're all thinking or you're asleep or on your phone or playing a game but so you know that's what we've been trying to figure out you know so what does all this mean well first of all when we look at the the answers we received on the household survey one of the questions asked about do you perceive that having no infrastructure is what's keeping you from riding a bike that, that was not the case people felt like there was good infrastructure uh, to be able to ride a bike. Um, as far as, you know, active transportation, people were generally positive towards active transportation and alternative modes, and that, of course, has been a lot, you know, further emphasized on the Wasatch Choices 2040 project where the, you know, the, the, the most, uh, what was the word, selected or whatever alternative out of that was a much more multimodal alternative. So. So this trending that we're having towards more bicyclists is definitely happening, and that's something we've got to be aware of. Uh, and so these, you know, these attitudes are changing in terms of uh, active transportation, alternative modes, and, and being able to provide for that. The other things that we saw, of course, is if we do add bike infrastructure, we increase volume. So by providing the infrastructure, people come, but as we provide that, we need to look at where we're providing it. If we're on a higher ADT roadway, people aren't riding as much on those roadways. If we've got a higher speed limit, that volume decreases significantly. Here we've actually got a statistically significant result, which you really don't see a lot in transportation data. So that's, that's an important result in our minds. So, you know, what should UDOT be doing? Well, obviously we need to be a part of active transportation. We need to be looking at ways to improve this, looking at ways to provide uh, alternative, tr alternative modes and be, you know, a part of that solution. Look at, you know, maybe 
and, and these are all preliminary and these are all my information. I don't have feedback from the TAC yet, so I may get attacked afterwards by the TAC. But, you know, we need to look at maybe how we can participate in installing bicycle facilities on adjacent roadways, not on our 60 mile an hour arterials, but the adjacent 30 mile an hour uh, collector street. And see how that can be, you know, how we can be a part of that in providing a solution. And then, of course, being a good partner, which UDOT is, in working with our you know, local and county agencies in really providing alternatives for active transportation. So, the, you know, the data, the data are showing us that people are not riding as much on the higher volume roadways, on the higher speed roadways, but in general, they are riding, and we want to provide for that mobility need. The other side of it, of course, the limitation side of things, you know, this, this really forms a good baseline. We haven't done uh, a lot of research like this in the past, and so we don't have the trends to show where we're going and what's happening, but we, you know, now's a good time to get started on collecting that data. Uh, we had 42 sites where we collected data. You know, it's a relatively small sample size, but it was enough to get, you know, this, the significance that we wanted but we definitely should expand that and collect more data, which, of course, then ties into Shauna's colorful bike presentation that I'll do my best to, uh, to try and give here as well. But, you know, we've got to start collecting more data. We've got, we've got lots of data on all aspects of automobile transportation, but we've got to do more on the bike side. And some of that is more automated. Uh, Mark Taylor's working very hard in terms of getting the, uh, the, the radar systems to collect bike data and intersections. And we've got lots of, well not lots, we've got quite a bit of data on trails, but we've got to look at our roadways as well to see what's happening there. So does anybody have any questions before I move on? Yes. It was actually 10 percent. So the question is, you know, the data aren't showing a lot of people utilizing these systems. So why should we spend any money on improving infrastructure if they're not using more, any more money? You know, and that, my response to that would be because UDOT needs to be part of the entire solution in terms of all modes of transportation. And the, the best thing that we can provide to improve transportation in the state is alternatives. So if we participate in that and provide infrastructure, whether it be on a state road or participate with the cities and counties in determining where the best place is for that, then we provide for all modes. So my quantification is I said that that's based on my opinion. So my opinion as a transportation professional is that that's what we can do. I don't, I don't have the data. That's why I say this is a baseline type of a study to then see what happens over time with that. Comment here. Well, I live in Rose Park. And I moved to Rose Park basically because I thought it would be a great bicycling community. But people in Rose Park don't bike anywhere because they have to travel, they have to go over I-80 or I-15 to get anywhere. And this morning we had a fatality on I, on, a, on Redwood Road in I-80 because of poor infrastructure. So, and, and all of that is because UDOT 30 years ago, 40 years ago, thought it was much more important to build roads so people that lived in Tooele or Sandy or Pyramid could get to downtown rather than encouraging people to, who work downtown 
could live close enough so they could bike. So if you if you didn't hear that comment, the comment was that you know there was a fatality this morning because of a lack of infrastructure for bicycle facilities, and because we have focused more on the automobile, and we need to look at all modes and focus on all modes of transportation. There was another comment over here. So that comment was that the infrastructure has improved and, and it's been a lot better to be able to utilize that infrastructure than before when we didn't have it. And so that's you know, good, good input. Yeah, so the question is, is there a correlation between speed and, and essentially the type of facility that you've got? So whether you're actually physically separated from the automobiles or at least you know, you've got some space between you. So the data that we have collected, we don't have information on that. But in studies that have been done in other states, then it, it has been shown that that is the case. If you can, you know, that, that physical separation and how that mentally allows you to feel a little bit safer in terms of what you're doing and you're more apt to to utilize that if you look at the human factors side of the, the process so I don't I, we don't have the data though with that we'd love to so talk to research and have them uh, continue to fund this type of research and we'll continue to build upon that <laughs> shameless plug I mean yeah <laughs> So a threshold of miles or time that somebody would be willing to, to change. We did not look at that in our study. Um, there is research out there tied to that, but uh, I can't off the top of my head tell you what that says. Do you remember, Dave? Okay. So David says the research shows that it's more two, about two and a half to three miles is kind of the threshold where most people are willing to walk or bike to school. And so that, you know, that kind of goes to the comment back here where if you can live close and be able to, to walk and bike, you know, there's obviously trade-offs there in terms of costs and health benefits, a lot of things that go on. All right, well, let me uh, move on to Shauna's presentation, see what I can do. So, Sean has been doing a lot of research in terms of uh, the actual data counts, the data collection. Uh, it just wasn't where we needed it quite yet, so we ended up doing a lot of our counts that she's utilizing now in her study as well. Um, but as we, you know, I, I think hopefully the research that we've been doing, we have found that there's definitely a need to go out and collect data so that we can identify the demand for the infrastructure, identify locations for infrastructure, provide more, you know, we're providing some very general information, but we've got to get out and collect more data to really get into the true, you know, where do we really need this infrastructure to make this work well? And then what type of infrastructure is going to be best? And, you know, and again, whether that's on a state road or on a city road or a county road, that's, you know, that's all good information to identify where we can put that infrastructure in. Um, so, Sean has been working and, and she was, you know, worked with us in terms of the data that we collected as well. And there's, you know, a lot of different options out there to collect data. I showed you the two different ways that we collected data. <coughs> uh, the, the tracks, uh, and of course, there's other brands out there, but the, the, the bicycle kind of permanent counts, 
you know, the same way that we use tube counts on the roadway to collect vehicles, we could use those for bikes, but they're just a little bit, it's a smaller tube, a little bit different uh, computer system that keeps track of those bikes in terms of where those are going. So those are, you know, it's a good option for some short-term counts. Uh, there are some other uh, technologies out there that you can utilize for more long-term, 24-hour type counts. Uh, when I was in Portland this summer, on a, uh, you know, in a workshop on bicycle facility design and coursework and implementing that into to university courses, they've got you know a lot more bikes on the road in Portland, and they've got a lot of actual permanent count stations, so they can actually keep track of bike trends and see where that's uh, where that's moving in their in their state. And so you've kind of got to look at what's going to be best for your jurisdiction. And that's some of the stuff that, uh, that Sean is working on in her research. So just kind of same types of things that we talked about, you know, manual counts. Those are always gives you the, the most data. Uh, and whether you actually sit out there and collect them on site or you actually videotape and come back and watch those videotapes later, either way you can, you can utilize that. Uh, there's infrared, radar, tubes all those different alternatives and you know in addition to collecting bike data of course a lot of times we're interested in ped data and uh, a lot of these infrared counters will those will count peds or bikes uh, but you know of course you've got to look at the algorithms and identifying how accurate they are and, and differentiating between the two um, so Sean is working on this uh, Utah bicycle and pedestrian counts guide that looks at an overview of all the different methods that are out there for counting data, looks at the pros and cons associated with those, and then how we can actually execute those and, and, and utilize that in, you know, whether it's UDOT or your city or county, whichever, whatever uh, you might work for at this time. So this is a very comprehensive resource guide, and uh, hopefully once, you know, then once we get the guide developed and get some of the initial data collected, we can start collecting more data uh, across the state for this. So that's about as much detail as I can give you on Shauna's uh, presentation. Because those are all the slides she gave me and that's uh, all I can tell you. So any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, you know, if you were to ask somebody 15 years ago, 20 years ago, how many of them ride the train to work, there'd be none because there was no train to ride. But how much of this is latent demand? How much of it is, the words I would use a lot of times is, if you build it, will they come kind of a thing, right? You know, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. And that's, like I said, I can't answer that based on the research that we've done here. But as we build infrastructure and collect data, then we'll be able to better answer that question. And I think, you know, we see that all the time with roadways. You, you rebuild I-15 and then all of a sudden, the two days after it's open, it's, it's congested again because all those people who stayed away from I-15 because it was congested are now back. Oh, now we can drive again because now there's all that room for me on the road and there didn't used to be. So, you know, the, the real question we'd like to try and get to here is if we build a bike lane, how does that take demand away from the roadway? Well, the volumes are low and there, there's no getting around that. It's not, it's not a whole lane of traffic that we're going to take off of that with the bike. But when we add a bike lane and we add transit and we add walking facilities and we make more livable communities and mixed land use, that's where, in my opinion, as a transportation professional, all of those alternatives add up. And we have to be a player in all that we do. We can't just look at one mode of transportation. So familiarity with multi-use sidewalk? Yeah, 
Um, so I haven't done a lot of research on that side of things. Um, my personal opinion is that, you know, that provides alternatives for multiple modes. You get pedestrians, you get bikes. You, it's a nice separated bike facility if those are allowed on that facility. Uh, Provo has been doing that a lot along Ninth East. They're, uh, they're trying to put in an entire corridor of bikes and peds that they can get people kind of off of the road. So to me, they're, they're a good option. If we've got the right of way, I think it's a good use of your space. So, so the question is how many actual, like, actual numbers of bikes we were counting on there. I mean, they were, we, most of, uh, well, actually all of the analysis that I showed here was on the peak hour counts. And so we were getting anywhere from, you know, 10 bikes an hour upwards to 40 or 50. There wasn't a ton of bikes, but they're, you know, they were still a pretty good number. And, and these were all spot counts over two different, we'd do two days at each location. Um, and so again, where more data is definitely more helpful. And if we could figure out, you know, get better automated data so that we could really look at those trends, then we'd have a better feel like we do on our, with our automobiles. Uh, so the question was in the in the Wasatch Choices 2040 study, there was a question that asked about would you be supportive of bike lanes and, and such, but did the question actually ask or show what the cost would be associated to that and if they'd be willing to lose, give up some right-of-way for that? Is that what you're asking? I don't know. Is there anybody in the room who knows the answer to that question? I've just read the you know the summary stuff. I wasn't involved in any of the actual study questions. You know the argument I've heard for people like Portland and Minnesota is all the bike bike infrastructure in the world costs about the same as a mile of freeway. And so if we ask if we ask the average person, would you be willing to spend a million dollars to put a street light on this intersection? People would say no. That's ridiculous. A million dollars is a lot of money. But that's what we spend to put in a summer for. Well, <laughs> street lights can cost a lot of money, but it's not a four and can't cost. Them. No, and I didn't say a normal lane costs a million dollars. How much does one mile of I-15 cost in Salt Lake City? Yeah. No, no, I-15, one mile of I-15. Billion? Hundred million? Yeah, I don't, I don't have all those numbers here. And so, you know, there's obviously a cost associated to it, and there's a, a benefit, and just like every other project we do, we've got to look at those alternatives. Ours was to look at the, the data itself and identify kind of what's out there to get us started with that. Since we've been kind of talking about costs um, and who pays for it, down in Southern Utah, um, we start talking with elected officials about transportation and they start talking about bikes, there's always this conversation about both guys aren't paying for what they're asking for. And I was just wondering, in other states, do, uh, do have the states enacted some kind of bicycle registration so they pay a, a token fee every year? And is that something that Utah might might look at on, with road bikes? So the question is, you know, have, have other states enacted any kind of a transportation fee or a registration fee for bikes to try and get some of this cost back? Uh, I'm not sure. I actually haven't. I haven't ever looked at the costs associated with that and how those are paid for in other states. Did you see anything that you're doing, David? 
So David Bassett was another research assistant I had on this project, but he's since graduated and moved on, so he's looking at some of the other stuff. But I, I never saw that. When I was in Portland, they never talked about that. I'm not aware of any tax that they're doing there. Uh, you know, that's part of the cost of building a road in, in a lot of ways, and most of that comes from general tax anyway, rather than gas tax, so. So the, the, the basic comment there was that you know all of our alternative modes are, are subsidized to some extent, and this is one of them. Uh, and our automobiles are subsidized too. You know we're, we're kidding ourselves if we say that gas tax is paying for our, our automobiles. I mean we all work in that industry. We know that, and uh, you know it's part of the tax of having a, a transportation system that improves our economy and, and makes a great state like Utah that we've got to live in. All right, any other comments? We can, no one ever gets upset when we end early, but, uh, oh yeah, we don't want to end early, we got more questions. Speed differential. Yeah. Yeah, when, when the, the, the comment is that when you start combining bikes and peds, you have, you have issues that come up because of the speed differences and because of strollers and the recreation versus commuter. Most people that use those kind of routes are usually riding slower. I mean, the, the true bikers that are in here, you know, Mark's not going to ride on a sidewalk ever. He's going to ride on the road. And he's probably going to ride faster than half the people on the road. I'm, I'm a road cyclist, and I, I actually ride Legacy Parkway on the lot, and I ride it and, until they have those gates, and then I take the, um, the roadways through to Caseville and Farmington. But it can work really well where people are ready for it. Everybody who, who enjoys Legacy Parkway knows that there's different user groups. There's, there's walkers, there's runners, there's moms with strollers, and there's avid cyclists too that are going fast when they can, but hopefully we're, we're responsible and sensitive enough that we're going to slow down and let them know that we're going to pass. So where, where people are aware, I think it can work really well, and I think Legacy Parkway is a good example. Yeah, and I think I think the key that you said there was that you know the avid cyclist or the you know most cyclists are going to pay attention and be aware and watch what's going on. Yeah, uh, you know you're not going to get that all the time with teenage kids or you know other things like that. But for the most part, people can can work together, or they're they're going to ride on the road because that's where they want to be. Yeah, I mean, that's what one of my recommendations was, you know, UDOT just needs to work with the cities and counties and identify, we need to provide those alternatives, those routes to give us, you know, a, a way to get from our origin to our destination. If we're on the high volume, high speed roadways, people don't want to be on those roadways, let alone whether we want to include them or not. Yeah, I mean, they still have the right to be there, whether there's a facility or not, so we've always got to share the road, but whether we provide that alternative or that, 
that infrastructure on every road. I don't think we need it on every road. Right. Yeah, we can't have everything everywhere, but we want to provide alternatives. Every, every time we get a nice corridor in Provo that's nice and straight and through, then someone decides to buy out the road and close it, whether it's uh, the city or other people or other organizations. But yeah, I mean, so the comment here was, you know, we people do utilize some of these major arterials because they are the only direct shot to get where we need to go. So we've got we've to we've work together and identify what the best alternatives are for those. Once we put BRT on University Avenue, that's going to be interesting too in terms of how that all fits in there. But, you know, we're going to put everything on there, right? That's the way it's going to work. <laughs> everything will be there. It'll be our one multimodal route. We'll have, we'll have it all. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you.